Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Hebrews. Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. That's the end of today's lesson. <laughs> Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. I'm not a Hebrew. So what am I doing reading this and teaching it? I've been saying all the way through this teaching that we are like eavesdroppers, listening in on a conversation. The writer to the Hebrews is writing to them, trying to explain to them the finished work of Christ and the operation of the Holy Spirit. And we already know all this. I mean, most of us, if not all of us in here, intimately understand the details of the faith, uh, the working of the, the Spirit of God, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. We understand this. So what are we doing listening in on this conversation? It's just to the Hebrews who don't understand it. And the writer to the Hebrews is attempting to explain to them how uh, the gospel of grace was formed in such a way that they can themselves become part of it. Uh, earlier today, I was talking with someone about denominationalism, and there are a lot of denominations. A lot of people believe a lot of different things. I just believe in salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly, that's what the writer to the Hebrews was writing about. Now, he's using complex language, but that's what he's talking about. The superiority of, Christ, the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament prophets. Well, we know that. The Hebrews, the practicing Hebrews in 68 AD when this book was written, didn't know that. The superiority of Christ, in fact, over the angelic authority throughout the universe. The Hebrews had an idea in, in their way of thinking that, that there were ranks of angels. Uh, Michael, in particular, who's the archangel of Israel, in their mind, probably ranked higher than the Messiah. Or it was possible that he did. Well, the writer to the Hebrews says, no, no, no. Christ is superior to the angels. Well, he... I don't have to have that proven to me. He's the Son of God. But the Hebrews, they were wrestling with, like, what's ha what happens in heaven? And, and how's this thing all going to work out? So Christ is sovereign over the angels. And, and then the writer to the Hebrews goes on and says Christ is, is superior to Moses, the lawgiver. And, of course, it's the law that kept the temple running. The priesthood, the rankings of priesthood, the Levitical, Levitical order, the family of Aaron, the whole thing it was a, a finely tuned machine that was based upon the law of Moses. And the writer to the Hebrew comes along and says, no, no, no. Christ is superior to Moses as well. In fact, Christ's priesthood is superior to Moses' priesthood. And as we uh, go on through uh, the book, point by point by point, uh, Christ is superior to Moses. We should enter into the rest, that is, to the, to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, the writer to the Hebrews talks about the Aaronic priesthood, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the Levitical priesthood introducing the concept that there is another priesthood, and the writer to the Hebrews calls it the Melchizedekian priesthood. And we're going to get into that a little bit more deeply today. And then in chapter 6 in Hebrews, uh, he said this. The writer to the Hebrews said, let's leave behind all of the elementary teachings of uh, the law and of the 12 tribes, and of the doctrine of multiple washings for purity and cleanliness, and of the various priestly ordinances, the laying on of hands, and on the various priestly teachings about the resurrection of the dead. 
and the various priestly teachings of eternal judgment. Let's, let's go on beyond that because the Son of God has come. He has finished His work and then He's gone back to heaven. He sent us His Holy Spirit. We need to go on beyond these elementary principles. Well, that's chapter 6. Not salvation by fruit bearing, but fruit bearing through grace. We're thinking of a whole new different way of doing things. And in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, if you recall, when we studied that, the word rest appears nine times. <clears throat> and uh, we talked for a while about uh, the fact that, that, that nine in Scripture is a very specific number. Anytime you see nine of anything, it's uh, a statement of divine finality. So in chapter 4 here we have the word rest mentioned nine times. We talked about the fact that the 27 books of the New Testament are divided into three groups of nine. We talked about the fact that uh, the Lord preached nine beatitudes. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. We could go, we could talk for the next hour about nines. Nine times the word rest is used here, a statement of di divine finality. Today we're going to look at the priesthood of Melchizedek, and in the book of Hebrews, the, the name Melchizedek is mentioned precisely nine times. Surprise, surprise. And that's because this is a statement of the finality of the Melchizedekian priesthood. <clears throat> Chapter 6, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. That's basically the theme of the book. Although that theme is restated later in Chapter 8, and I think probably we'll get to that uh, today. Let's uh, move ahead now and, and take a look at starting in about the ninth verse of chapter 6. <clears throat> you remember the eighth verse of chapter 6 says, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. In my opinion, that's a reference to the temple of Jerusalem in the first century. <clears throat> temple of Herod. Uh, it's, it's fascinating that the writer to the Hebrews wrote this about two, maybe three, some people say, years before the burning of the second temple. Uh, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, not only burnt to the ground, but disassembled by the Romans till, until it was level with the ground. And, it, and yet, at the time the writer to the Hebrews wrote this, it was fully functioning, and it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But the writer to the Hebrews says in verse 8 of chapter 6, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. And that happened a couple of years later, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, the temple was the place where they brought Jesus. They brought him into the temple area, into the fortress of Antonia. They, they took him uh, two or three places. And they tried him, found him guilty of death, and then they executed him in the, the most horrific way in this beautiful place. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In AD 70, it was taken apart stone by stone. And the writer to the Hebrews is saying, look, this whole thing is going to be taken apart stone by stone, because there's something better now. <clears throat> but beloved, verse 9 of chapter 6, we are uh, persuaded better things of you. And things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Better things. Like I say, we have this incredibly uh, complex denominational belief system. We believe in salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what else do you believe in? No, that pretty much does it. It's what I believe in. Oh, okay. Well, don't you believe in anything else? No, that pretty much covers it all. That's pretty. Oh, there are a few details. 
But that pretty much covers it. Yeah, but don't you have to do something to merit this salvation by grace through faith, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me see. No. Don't have to do anything. Oh, come on. You've got to do something, you know. You have to stand up when the organ begins to play, whatever. Well, we don't have a, a, an organ. Well, we do, but it's broken. <clears throat> <laughs> so wh what do you guys do? <laughs> we believe. And that, that's amazing, actually. We stop and think about that. It's totally am an amazing idea. And that's what's better. But beloved, and by the way, if you study uh, one of those fancy seminary books, ver they will say of verse 9 that the word beloved is a, a hapax legomenon, which is seminaries for that's the only place in the book of Hebrews that you'll find this word, beloved. Now you find it many, 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 many times in uh, the, uh, the epistles of Paul. But in Hebrews, it occurs only this one time, right at this key moment when he's saying, look, you got to go in a better direction. Beloved, this puts a kind of an emphasis on it. We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you've showed uh, toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the name or show the same uh, diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. The writer to the Hebrews is writing here to the visible, professing church that's made up of saved and unsaved. Now that's kind of fascinating. Again, and you say, well, wait a minute, he's writing to the, basically to the priesthood of, uh, of Aaron in the temple facility, and, the, and he's writing uh, in the context of all of their formalities. But in fact, in that temple setting, there was a professing church. In the temple of Herod, there was a, if you would, you could call it a professing church that was right on the verge of being a, a, a believing church, and, but yet it was still clinging to all of the formalities of temple worship. And so the letter to the Hebrews is, is a unique thing. It couldn't happen today. The writer is writing to a group that doesn't even exist today because there's no temple. There's, nobody is, is performing the sacrifices and oblations of the temple. And at the same time, claiming to be a follower of the risen Christ. It just, it's just impossible for that to happen. So this is like a one-time, one-shot deal. Well, why is this even in the Bible? It's in the Bible because it's an excellent proof of what the Lord is, is doing, what the Lord has done. And here in this exhortation to go on to better things, that is to a higher level of spiritual maturity, he talks about Abraham. God made promise by Ab to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, which is true. If you go back and read about the life of Abraham, saying, surely I'll bless thee, multiplying will multiply thee, that's the Abrahamic covenant, which, by the way, is still a covenant in force today, a covenant in perpetuity. 
So if you ever get a chance to be a blessing to a Jew, don't miss the opportunity because the Lord says, I'll bless those who bless the Jews. And there are a lot of people around today who are trying to kill Jews. And I wouldn't want to be one of those because the Lord does not forget. And so, verse 15, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, an oath, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing uh, more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the Im uh, immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. God swore by two immutable things. Number one, he made the promise, verse 17. And in verse 17, he confirmed it by an oath. He promised Abraham a number of things, covenantally. Then he uh, endorsed and sanctified the covenant by an oath. Now when God takes an oath, it's, that's, wow. <laughs> Don't try to break that oath. And the covenant, uh, and we could go back and study uh, in Genesis, the Abrahamic covenant. It's an ironclad covenant with a lot of uh, codicils and, and a lot of provisions. And, and God's going to keep every single one of them. Curiously, the people of the world ignore the Abrahamic covenant. They, they just think, well, that was thousands of years ago. It no longer applies. It does. It's still in force. It's in force because uh, he's, God swore by two immutable things. Immutable means unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Uh, we have strong consolation, says the writer. I think Paul wrote Hebrews, but I always say the writer to the Hebrews because nobody knows for sure. Although you can make an excellent case that Paul wrote it, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek being the Hebrew for king of righteousness. So he made the promise and he kept the oath. And there's one of the most beautiful figures here uh, in verse 20 that you will ever see. This, this figure, and this is why I think Paul wrote it, because this is the way Paul thought all the time. He thought in word pictures, in metaphors. And verse 19 says, we, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. The anchor of the believer is fastened within the veil of the Holy of Holies in heaven. So if you think of yourself as a ship on a storm-tossed sea, the sea being the world, you need an anchor. You, that is, you need a, a way of stabilizing your little ship on the, on the waves of life and the deep, dark waters beneath, the, the waters of Sheol, you know, where Jonah once visited in the belly of a fish. There's a, we're, we're in this little boat of uncertainty, uh, the waves lapping over, and, and the writer to the Hebrews says, we have hope. And by the way, that's probably the central message of uh, Christianity, the blessed hope. We have hope, and it's like an anchor of the soul. In other words, that anchor is fastened from our little ship and it goes through the veil. It penetrates the veil and it's, where is it anchored? It's anchored right on the Holy of Holies, which is the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. The Ark of the Covenant, of course, represents the covenantal promise of, uh, of uh, our Lord. We are anchored 
our anchor goes through the veil. That is, it penetrates beyond the things that we can see. Uh, there is, by the way, a temple in heaven. And the anchor of our soul is firmly secured to the Holy of Holies in the heavens. Whether the forerunner, that's Jesus, is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Not a high priest during the church age, not a high priest during the age of law, not a high priest during the kingdom age, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is a high priest. And if you look at the book of John, the, the entire gospel of John speaks of Jesus as the Lamb of God, the, the sacrificial offering. John also was given the privilege of writing Revelation. If you go to Revelation, you find Christ there as high priest. During the whole book of Revelation, Jesus functions as the high, he is seen functioning as the high priest. Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, prince of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being, uh, first being by interpretation the king of righteousness, and after that also the king of Salem, that is the king of peace, Melech uh, Shalom, uh, he is the king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest uh, continually. Melchiz Melchizedek is mentioned as a type. He has no historical record. There is no historical record. Uh, now the Jews in their historical records say that Melchizedek probably was Shem, son of Noah. And if you look at, at the years of Shem, Shem certainly did live long enough to have been a contemporary of Abraham after the flood. I don't th think that we can say it was Shem. The Jews say that, that Melchizedek, Melchizedek and, and Shem are the same person. In fact, he's presented here as somebody who is a, a type, a type of Christ with no historical record. Now in Israel, no man outside the family of Aaron could exercise the priestly functions. Melchizedek has no familial uh, lineage. And technically speaking, he would not be eligible under the law to serve as a priest. And it is with this idea that we continue, because what the writer to the Hebrews is doing now is saying, look, the family of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, worked under certain conditions for a limited period of time. But before that priesthood, there was another priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek, and it's an eternal priesthood. It says, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It is that priesthood, if you will, to which we uh, cling. That is, we have an anchor uh, of the soul that extends into the Holy of Holies in heavenly places. And it is a sure and fast anchor that we have. For this Melchizedek, verse 1, King of Salem, Prince the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, uh, first uh, being by interpretation King of Righteousness, and after uh, that also King of Salem, which is King of Peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto, that is, he's a type of the Son of God, abideth a priest uh, continually. Let's flip back uh, to uh, Genesis for just a minute and, and just take a quick look at Melchizedek in the Old Testament. You go back to Genesis uh, chapter... 14. God had promised Abraham 
After Lot separated from him, he had promised him a land grant. He said, lift up your eyes and look to the, uh, from the place where you are. Look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. For all the land which you see, to you I will give this and to your seed forever. Well, that's what God told Abraham. And, and when God says something, that's it. It's done. Now there are people who hate the idea the Jews are over there right now on that piece of ground. They, boy, they hate that idea. But it's in the book. It's, it, this is a contract here. Signed by the finger of God, in effect. <clears throat> and so God tells Abraham, go just walk around the land and, and, and look at it. And I'm going to give it to you. Chapter 14 says this, and it came to pass, and this is during Abraham's initial days in the Holy Land, uh, in the days of Amraphel king of Shinar, Ariok king of Elisar, Kedarlaomer king of Elam, and Tidal king of nations, that these made war with Birah king of Sodom. Well, that's where Lot had gone, down to the area of Sodom, because it was a, a much more beautiful and productive land. <clears throat> These days it's nothing but brimstone. These made war, these four kings made war with Bera, the king of Sodom. That's south now, at the south end of Israel, south of Israel, down south uh, of the Dead Sea. And with Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinav, king of Adma, Shemember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. So these uh, Four great kings came from the north, the east, and the west, and they came down through Abraham's territory, and they were headed for Sodom and Gomorrah to take that land. Why would they want it? Because it was the best land. And it also produced oil. That's another story, which was a, a, a useful product. And these... All these were joined together in the Vale of Sidim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedarlaomer. In the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year came Kedarlaomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth of Karnaim. The Rep Rephaims were giants. And the Zuzims in Ham. The Zuzims were another a species of giant. And the Amims in Shaveh Kiriataim, and that was another species of giants. So what do we have here? We have four Gentile kings invading the land of Abraham, invading Sodom and Gomorrah, killing off a bunch of giants in the process. This is a very interesting forerunner of biblical prophecy because these four kings represent the four stages of Gentile uh, development in prophecy. If you go to Daniel, for example, you find four great world empires. <clears throat> and those four great world empires span the entire redemptive history of mankind. Here you have four kings. Now this is a long time before that. First king is Amraphel, king of uh, Shinar. Interesting. Babylon. Shinar. Babylon. You have Ariok, king of Elisar. Well, how about that? Elisar is what is today southeastern Europe, or Greece. So you have the, the, the Greeks represented. Kedarlaomer, king of Elam. Elam is the forerunner of Persia. So you have the Persian kings. And Tidal, king of nations. And Tidal is universally thought to be the precursor of Rome. So you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome represented here in four kings who came down, invaded the land, uh, and they were a type of that which was later to happen. There was a great war. <clears throat> in the process of this war, Lot was kidnapped. Uh, Genesis 14, 12 says, They took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram in Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, son of Eshcol, brother of Anir. And these were confederate with Abram. 
Long story short, Abram got together an army of men, pursued the four kings to the north, rescued Lot, and then came back and was blessed by Melchizedek, the king of, uh, of uh, Salem. That's starting in uh, uh, Genesis 14, 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedilaomer and the kings that were with him in, at the Valley of Shaveh, which is in the king's dale. The Valley of Shaveh uh, is very close to or exactly in line with the present day Valley of Hinnom in <coughs> South Jerusalem. <coughs> And there he ran into Melchizedek, king of Salem. This is before Jerusalem was Jerusalem. It was called Salem at that point. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, brought forth bread and wine. And the, those, of course, you'll quickly uh, recognize as sacraments of the Lord's Supper. And he was the priest of the Most High God. He was a priest of El Elyon, the Most High God. So here is the priesthood of Melchizedek. And it is set in this, uh, this, if you will, bigger than life battle of the four kings. Because the battle of the four kings involves territory. It involves God's land grant. It, it involves the tribes of the giants. It involves, it involves the, the Semitic tribes versus the Gentile tribes. It involves everything that you run into in later history in the Bible. It's a precursor. It foreshadows all of the prophecy that you see being highly developed in the rest of the Bible. And smack in the middle of it, when the, when the smoke clears, Abram goes down to what is now Jerusalem, in South Jerusalem, near the city of David, which, by the way, it's going to be a long time before David is born at this point. <clears throat> and he receives the blessing from the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And he blessed him, verse 19, and he said, Blessed be Abraham, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So we have a, a, a transaction here between Abram and Melchizedek, which is the precursor of all of the agreements that would ever be made between God and his holy people. And that includes us, by the way, because we are, and the writer to the Hebrews will later go on and tell us that we are of the seed of Abraham. We are not seeds, plural, we are seed. We are of the seed of Abraham who received uh, salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how Abraham got saved. And what do you know? We believe the same thing Abraham did. But between Abraham and the present, there's a, a lot has happened. <clears throat> so you go back to Hebrews 7, 4. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of his spoils, the spoils of victory over the four Gentile kings. I mean, does it get any clearer than that? Abraham beat the four, four Gentile kings. I mean, I'm tempted to say something like boom, bada, bing, or one of those other theological expressions. I mean, it's just, there it is. <laughs> you know, it's, that's amazing. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren. Though they come out of the loins of Abraham, but he whose descent is not counted from them, uh, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. These men that die receiving tithes are the Aaronic priesthood. They are mortal men. They are just, you know, they come and they go. They, they do short service in the temple at the time this is written. They are 
men with a job to do under the law, and they are doing it. And they are called men that die. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And so, and as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes, uh, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, the less, lesser being blessed by the greater is a, a supreme biblical idea. And the thrust of Hebrews is that the greatest of all was the Son of God. And that Melchizedek was anointed priest by El Elyon, who later fathered the Son of God, and the sanctification received by Abraham not only predates, but precludes and surpasses any subsequent blessing. Verse 9, and as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham. Levi, who hadn't even been born yet, paid his tithes through Abraham generations earlier. And it's almost in, in that way that we receive blessing through Christ. Uh, Christ's death was generations ago, and yet we are continually blessed by Christ and by no other. Even though Christ has passed from this earth, he died, he was buried, he's resurrected. His work continues, that is his work of blessing, continues this day, and he has paid it all. As the old hymn says, you know, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And, and so this principle is being very carefully spelled out in uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. If you say, well, we at our assembly uh, do some things different than you do at your assembly when you meet on Sunday. And we believe that because we do these things, we're observing uh, elements of Christianity that, are, that make us superior in our worship to you. And I'm sure you've run into that from time to time. But I got to tell you, salvation by grace through faith, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, cannot be topped. It just, there's nothing greater, nothing higher. And that's the argument here, and it's a very technical argument that is being made by the writer to the Hebrews, who then goes on to say in verse 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that, that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? And by the way, in verse 11, that's the sixth occurrence of the word Melchizedek. Verse 12, for uh, the priesthood being changed, uh, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he whom these things are spoken, he of whom these things are spoken, pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it's evidence that our Lord uh, sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So our Savior is not from the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who appears in the New Testament as a, the Lamb of God. And so his entire life is played out in, in this incredible conflict, lion and lamb, which is resolved in the book of Revelation when the lamb becomes the judge in Revelation uh, chapter 5. 
It's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And, it's yet, and, and by the way, he's speaking this now to priests and to uh, diligent, worshipful Jews in the first century who are caught in this uh, internal conflict. Should I continue to worship in the traditional way at the temple and also worship the risen Christ? Would it be okay for me to leave the temple and also worship Christ or continue to worship Christ? And, and if you were a faithful Jew, this would really be a conundrum in, in your mind at that time. Uh, particularly if you, know, if, if you can actually see this incredible operation which we can only think about in abstract terms, that the, the temple of Herod was simply phenomenal. If you have read about the, the structure and, and the ordinances and the, the, the literally thousands of people that it took to keep it in daily operation. It's an amazing operation. Uh, it, it had gold by the pound plastered all over the walls. It had uh, silk curtains, you know, silk imported from China. It had uh, artistic decorations from uh, the Greco-Roman Empire. It had, uh, it had contributions that literally came from everywhere in the Roman Empire. And, it, and when it was all put together, and it took 100 years, by the way, to, uh, to, to, to build it. And the year after it was built, it was totally destroyed by the Romans, which is one of the great ironies in history. And by the way, the man writing here in the Hebrews is saying, look, 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 this thing's going to burn. And you better decide how it is you're going to worship. But it would be easy to see how you would cling to that magnificent service that, and all of those priestly ordinances because they are things you can see with your eyes. You can smell the sacrifices being burnt on the offer. Uh, uh, the altar of offering. You, you, you can hear the water being poured. You can hear the, the, uh, the priestly chants and the sounding of trumpets and the marches and all the ordinances. And wow, it'd be hard to tear yourself away from all of that. But the writer of the Hebrews is saying, these things are going to burn. Just It's time to move toward the Lord. And besides, the Aaronic priesthood is imperfect. That's what he's saying here. And furthermore, he says in verse 14, our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah. And Moses in the law says absolutely nothing about the tribe of Judah being a, uh, a tribe eligible for priesthood. <clears throat> verse 15, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude, the likeness of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, that is a, a legal requirement. We're not talking here about legalities. The 613 commandments are the most stringent code of legalities ever crafted in the history of humanity. And here they are called carnal commandments who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. We believe uh, in, the, in our particular denomination uh, in salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But wait, we're not a denomination. We're just Christians. Well, what shall we call ourselves? I don't know. What do you want to call yourself? I'm Gary, <laughs> and I'm a Christian. What can I say? This is what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. <clears throat> For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Forever. He's quoting Psalm 110.4 here. And he also repeats himself as you go on, verse 18, where there's verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weaknesses and unprofitableness thereof, for the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. 
by the which we draw nigh unto God. In other words, our better hope comes through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it does make perfect. It makes me perfect. And if you can make me perfect, that is doing something, let me tell you. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For uh, those priests were made without an oath. But this, with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110.4. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, a better agreement, a better covenant. And of course, that's the New Testament. And here the, the New Testament is being called better than the Old Testament. How is the New Testament better than the Old Testament? You can't get any better than the Torah. The Torah is absolute perfection in every single letter. The Torah is the law. How can you get better than the Torah? Well, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God in flesh. <clears throat> God in flesh is better than a Torah scroll. I got to tell you. Even though they're both perfect, they're perfect in different ways. <clears throat> and they... Truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And the whole idea of intercession, that is an intercessory priesthood, is very much a heart of the New Testament issue. Romans 8, 26, Likewise the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not uh, what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit uh, itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He's, uh, he is our high priest intercessor before the throne of God. Uh, Romans 8, 27 says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. In Romans 8, it says, Who can condemn us? It's Christ that died, uh, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So we have a continuing intercessory priesthood in the risen Christ, which is way better than any other priesthood you ever heard about. It's, that's all we need. We have that intercessor. Verse 26, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests that is, the high priest's in Herod's temple, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this did he once, when he offered up himself. And here he points out another difference between the Aaronic priesthood and the priesthood of Melchizedek. The Aaronic priest has to offer up offerings for his own sins, sacrifices to cover his own sins before he offers up offerings for the people's sins. And that, of course, is true also of the idea of the high priest going once a year into the Holy of Holies, putting the blood of sacrifice on the Ark of the Covenant. There he also has to offer up blood sacrifice for his own sins before he offers up sacrifice for the people. So it's a daily thing, it's an annual thing, it's a repetitive thing, it has to be done over and over again. It's not perfect, where our intercessor is perfect because he offered up something perfect which was his own blood once for all time. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, weakness, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. That takes us all the way back to chapter 
6, verse 17, where we started earlier. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Not only did he make the promise, but he took the oath. And that's what the writer is saying here in verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, weakness, sickness. But the word of the oath, God took the oath, saying, the promise that I have made to you, Abraham, is immutable. I swear it by myself. Wow. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh a son who is consecrated forevermore. One final note, the word consecrated there, to consecrate means to dedicate something upon a holy altar. Well, how did the son consecrate the promise? He did it by resurrecting himself. That's how he did it. Making him the ultimate offering. He's the Lamb of God. He was slain for the sins of the people. But he went one step beyond your usual lamb. All the other lambs that had ever been slain could not say, I rise again and go to my Father. But this lamb not only participated in the promise and the oath, but he consecrated the promise and the oath by rising from the dead. It's staggering when you stop and think about what he did for us by the depth of his love. I mean, it's, just, it's absolutely amazing. And when you study it in the Word, I mean, it always just gets you right here. It's just amazing. And there we'll stop for today.